the New World Translation, which was basically produced by a cult, the Jehovah's Witness, and others, is one of the only translations in the Bible to purposely mistranslate words and grammar for their own theological viewpoint. And the passage that we're going to look at today in Philippians chapter 2 and beginning at verse 5 is one of those passages that has been purposely mistranslated. The other passage is found in the Gospel of John and the first chapter. And in both of these instances, the reason why these verses were lexically, word-wise, and grammatically mistranslated was because they are very, very clear declarations about the fact that Jesus Christ is God, that he is deity. And of course, uh, amongst all major cults, one of the things that they all hold in common, whether it's Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Christian Science, so on and so forth, one of the things they all hold in common is their denial of the deity or the godness of Jesus Christ. And uh, in order to support that view, they have had to mistranslate or purposely retranslate some very, very clear statements about the fact that Jesus Christ was God. In uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Paul continues his theme of this one-mindedness, this one-purposefulness. You remember last week in Philippians 2, 1 through 4, two times he says, I want you to be of like-minded, like soul. I want you to think this particular way. And now, in chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, he's going to tell us about that mindset. And he's going to tell us about who has that mindset and can give it to us. Yes, Paul exhorts them and us to have a humble and sacrificial spirit and attitude like Jesus Christ, like Christ exemplified when he died on the cross. Notice Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. The New International Version, sa version says this, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I think the old King James says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And uh, by mind, they mean attitude. We, we can't actually have the mind of Christ, can we? I'm not going to be omniscient and know all things. That would certainly help uh, you know, us as students, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to go into class and know all things or understand all things? No, that's not what the text is saying. It's talking about an attitude. It's talking about a mindset. You should have this attitude. This attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And this points backward to uh, the biblical concept that was mentioned in Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Be of like-minded, be of like uh, spirit, be of like purpose. But it also points forward because it is, a mind, it is the mindset of Christ Jesus as exemplified in his humble and sacrificial service to humanity. Now in verse Six, he's going to tell us about Jesus Christ. He says, who, being in the very nature of God. The particular word here is morphe, and we get words like metamorphosis from it. And morphe is a word that speaks about not so much the outward appearance of a person, but the inward essence, the nature, the composition of the person. And of Jesus Christ, Paul says, you know, Jesus Christ is in the very nature of God. He has existed in all, has always existed in the essence, the nature, the character of God. He existed not only in the physical form of a man, but also in the total spiritual and character composition of God. He existed from eternity past, and he will exist for eternity future. Jesus Christ, the very nature of God. 
But being in the very, of na very nature of God, it goes on to say he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, the old King James says he did not consider it robbery. <laughs> and, of course, all of those terms are difficult to grasp onto. What is he really talking about here? But before we look at this word robbery or grasp, let us look at this clear statement which all of these cults bang into like a concrete wall. And that is the statement of his equality with God. The translation can't be any clearer by saying Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ equals God. Jesus Christ fully God. Who, in the very essence and nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be held on as a sense of robbery. Now, the difficulty that we have had with this word is that it only occurs this one time in the New Testament. And so often, when you only have one example of a word, it's hard to figure out what it means. As we go outside the Bible and we go to other Greek literature of a similar period or time, we see that the word does have something to do with robbery. It has to do with seizing onto something, grabbing onto something, clutching onto something. And it was used of people who stole things. As we go out into other literature, we find that it was used of soldiers who would be invading a city. You know, when an army would come against a city, they would surround it very often. And they would pick the vulnerable point of the walls and the gates. And then they would take and try to break down those walls and gates. And of course, the rule of war was the first one through the gate or over the fence got to keep whatever he found, the booty, the robbery, the treasures. And so as you've heard me say before, uh, among soldiers, it wasn't necessarily the bravest people who were through the gate first or over the wall. Sometimes it was the greediest of people. That was their motivation. Get into the city, pillage the city, gather the treasures, grasp them for yourself. And this is really, I think, the concept behind this idea of grasping or robbery. You see, Jesus Christ was in the very essence and nature and composition of God. He was equal to God with all of the, if we could say today, the rights and the privileges and the standings. But Jesus Christ did not consider that nature, he did not consider that standing, something to be hoarded, abused, or misused to his own advantage. And let me give a modern-day example. We've all been hearing about these luxurious, opulent palaces that Saddam Hussein has in Iraq. Some hundred-plus opulent, fabulous, beautiful palaces throughout the land, all for his pleasure, all with staff and people and food and everything just for him while people are starving, going without medicine, going without basic cares of life, not because of what the United States has done, but because of what a dictator has done. He is grasping, hoarding, abusing the things of his country, his position, his place of power for himself. And we see in this text that that's not what Jesus Christ did. He did not consider equality with God something to be abused or misused for his own personal welfare. And that's what the word means. But what did he do instead? Notice in verse 7. But it says he made himself nothing. Again, another translation says he emptied himself. 
And this is another uh, difficult concept for us because it's a word that only occurs a few times in the New Testament, and we have to stop and ask ourselves, well, in what way did Jesus Christ empty himself? In what way did God become non-God or become nothing? And, of course, people have speculated over the years. Some have said, well, he gave up his glory, the glory that he had in heaven, that Shekinah glory. But I say, wait a minute. I remember the New Testament telling me about that Shekinah glory showing at the transfiguration. That was something where he was able to take the disciples, the inner core, up on the mountain, and there before them he was able to what? Display his transfiguration, his glory. And, of course, at his resurrection, he displayed his glory. At his second coming, he displayed his glory. So it isn't his glory that he gave up. Some would say, well, Jesus gave up his independent authority, that as a human being, he was fully God, fully man, that he gave up his right to do anything by his own prerogative, and that he did only that which God told him to do. Now, that's true that Jesus did only what God the Father told him to do. It is true that he was always dependent and doing the will of the Father. But Jesus also said, I lay down my life. I take up my life. Jesus didn't give up his independent authority. In fact, the truth of the matter is he never had independent authority. For authority always dwelt within the triune Godhead in perfect harmony. There are others that say he gave up his prerogative of deity. And by this, uh, they mean uh, that he only acted as a human being, that he never acted as God. And yet, when you listen to his sermons, he says, I am who I am. And I am the well of life. I am the good shepherd. And Jesus spoke from his deity. Ah. He could have called down angels to deliver him, but he chose not to. He said to Pilate, you don't have any authority except that which is given to you. There are others that talk about he gave up his majesty, but you say, what do they mean by that? And finally, and most incorrectly, are those who say he gave up his relative attributes. In other words, all of the omnis. He was no longer omnipresent all places, omniscient, knowing all things, all powerful, so on and so forth, and that he gave up those things and was no longer equal with God. Well, that doesn't make any sense either. You remember when uh, Jesus uh, saw Nathanael coming from a distance. Uh, What does he say, Nathanael? I saw you when you were under the fig tree. When the people wanted to push him out and make him the king of kings, it says, no, he avoided that because he knew what was in the hearts of the people. There were times when he healed people and he knew the Pharisees and Sadducees were grumbling in their hearts and he exposed the sinfulness of their hearts. You remember the woman at the well. He said, "Uh, I know you have five husbands, the one you're living with. Jesus didn't give up his attributes. And so, if all of those things aren't true, then what does this mean? What does it mean when it says that he made himself nothing or he emptied himself? Now, this is what we call the main verb of this sentence. And we have to just get a little bit technical here to help you understand and explain what is going on. For in Greek, you can have a main verb, and then it can be followed by a number of things that are very descriptive and they define the action of that main verb. And for us, there are three descriptive things in this verse, ing words, that tell us exactly what it means when it says he made himself nothing. First of all, it says he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant. Secondly, being made in the likeness or human likeness, or the likeness of man. And finally, being found in the appearance of a man. Those three participles tell us what it means to, quote-unquote, empty oneself or to become nothing. 
being fully God, he didn't give anything up. He took something on. He took on the very nature of a servant, the very being of humanity, and the very appearance and likeness of a man. Now, let me use my illustration now, if I can. This cup is full of water, all right? And if I do this, the cup is emptying, correct? And that's one meaning of the word, is to empty something, all right? But at the same time that I'm emptying this, there's another way of describing figuratively what is going on here. And I am pouring out. And, and the word is used figuratively of to pour something out, to pour oneself out. And that is the best understanding of this verb and this context. Jesus Christ, it's not emphasizing that he emptied himself, but that he figuratively poured himself out. In what way? Not considering equality with God something to be hoarded, abused, or misused, he poured out his life in his humanity by becoming a servant, by being like man, by being found in the appearance of a man. And it goes on to say he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus Christ didn't give up anything. He took on something. And as a servant, he poured himself out for humanity. And this is the best understanding. Christ Jesus poured himself out for the sake of humanity. This emptying should, not be, should be understood in a figurative sense with the idea of ultimate sacrifice and surrender. Now, we have a similar figurative words like this. We sometimes will say of, a, of an athlete, we'll say, he left it all on the field, right? What do we mean by that? He gave his all. He, he put all of it into it. We might say of somebody who has done something, oh, they were totally drained. Well, does that mean that they lost something? <laughs> you know? And we even use the terminology that, oh man, he really poured himself into the project. And this is the figure of speech, the understanding of this particular text. In John 13, 3, it says this. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured out water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus Christ became a servant, didn't he? You know... Throughout church history, there's been lots and lots of people who have wanted to wear the crown, you know? But not so many who are willing to wrap on the towel. And if you want to wear the crown, you've got to wrap on the towel. Can you imagine how the disciples felt when they, you know, when they see Jesus get up and do the lowliest of servant thing to wash their feet? And, of course, you know how Peter reacted. You know, he let that pride well up and tried to rebuke Jesus for being a servant. And Jesus told him, look, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. Yes, Jesus became a servant, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. Now, this... Being made in human likeness is a wonderful phrase because it's a different word. It's the word uh, schemati. We get our English word schematics or a schematic drawing, and schemati emphasizes the outward form of a person, the outward uh, composition of a person. So Jesus was fully the morphe, the essence, the uh, character of God, and he took upon himself the appearance, the outward form of humankind. Now, even out of uh, this little phrase, the next one, we've had some heresy come forth where people, Gnostics in the 3rd and 4th century and uh, off and on throughout church history, 
whether it's uh, Christian science or others, have tried to say, well, Jesus wasn't really man. He was just appeared as man. He seemed like he was man. He looked like he was man, but he really wasn't man or human. Well, again, let's look at the life of Jesus. Was he thirsty? Absolutely. Was he hungry? Absolutely. Was he tired? Absolutely. Did he weep? Absolutely. Did he have a sense of humor? Absolutely. Did he pray? Absolutely. Did he bleed? Absolutely. Did he die? Absolutely. Was he born? Absolutely. Was he a little child? Did he grow? Remember what Luke says. He grew in favor with God, in favor with man. He grew in wisdom and he grew in stature. He was fully human. And therefore, he was the perfect mediator between God and man. This last phrase, in the likeness of humankind. Yes, Jesus was like humankind, but there was one very important and significant difference. And we know what that difference is is and was. It was that sin nature. He always existed as God, but he became man. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled or dwelt among us. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says it this way, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet, yet, he was without any sin. So Jesus is like us, but he is not us. For conceived of the Holy Spirit in the virgin birth and the product of the work of the Holy Spirit he was fully God and fully man. Yes, he understood all of the pressures and all of the aspects of humanity. And yet, he was without the sin nature, the Adamic nature. And he was without sin being committed in his life. Verse 8. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. You see, that's the mind, that's the attitude of Christ Jesus. That's what Paul is going to be pushing for for the next many chapters. Because he's going to get to that chapter 4, where he has Odia and Syntyche, who are in a conflict, it's, in, it's upsetting the church, it's got nothing to do with doctrine, it's got something to do with methodology, we're going to see, but Paul is trying to build up to that and say, look, if we are humble, sacrificial servants like Jesus Christ, we're going to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. And then he's going to follow this with talking about Timothy and Epaphroditus. And then Paul himself, he's going to give four examples of humble, sacrificial servants who give themselves for Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. You know, death on the cross was limited to non-Romans and the worst of criminals. It wasn't something that was administered lightly or normally. A Roman citizen could not be crucified or should not be crucified. And only the worst of criminals was to be crucified. We talk in America occasionally about somebody absolutely deserving the death penalty, such as the Beltway, they've talked about for the Beltway sniper. When you say the crime is so evil, it's so heinous, it's so terrible and barbaric that the only justice is death. And that's what crucifixion was reserved for under Roman law. It was an embarrassing, humiliating, shameful experience, let alone the pain that went with it. And Jesus Christ became obedient, obedient to God. You remember the struggle that he had in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, Lord, 
if this cup can just pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. And he yielded to that awful experience of having not only the sins of the world placed upon an all-holy being, but that mysterious, unexplainable separation when he cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Yes, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Hebrews 10, verse 7 says this, Then I will say, these are the words of Jesus, Here am I. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do thy will, O God. Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Oh, what a humble, sacrificial servant and example to each and every one of us to walk in his place. But the text and the sermon doesn't end at verse 8. It goes on to verse 9. Therefore, in light of this humble and sacrificial service, God has highly exalted him. And, and they had to put together some, some words to be able to say what Paul wanted to say here with highly exalted. It's a compound phrase that would mean super exalted, super highly exalted. And God has highly exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, it still puzzles me when I listen to commentators or read commentators about this particular passage when they try to define or figure out what that name is. Some say the name is Jesus. Some say the name is Jesus Christ. Some say the name is Son. Some say the name is Son of God. Some say it's God. Some say it's Lord. I say, what does the text say? <laughs> the names, it says, what? At the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord is a title, not a name, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the name that is above every name. Jesus, the name that means Savior. Yes, that is the name that God has given him. From the earliest prophecies of his birth, his name shall be called Jesus because he will what? Save his people. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And, and I think this is a trifold, what we call merism. It's a figure of speech for everyone, everywhere, in heaven and on earth, and maybe under the earth is a reference to the temporal abode of hell until the final lake of fire. But everyone will confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the resultant glory of God the Father. Jesus said himself in Matthew 23, 13, he says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And that was true of Jesus Christ. To acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord is to acknowledge that he is Yahweh God, fully God in deity in all that it pertains to. This verse is not teaching a final and universal salvation. For the rest of the scriptures tell us that that was not true. It tells us that those who are cowards and unbelieving and so on and so forth will be judged to eternal damnation. This theme of the lordship of Jesus Christ was very important in the preaching of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 32, Peter, preaching a sermon, says this, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of that fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see and you now hear. 
Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you have killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as the prince and the savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. And of course, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20 It says, when he, God, exerted in Christ Jesus, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that has been given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He is our high priest interceding for us and that should be a great source of strength and comfort you know when i read the newspaper when i see what's going on on the international scene when i look at the dictators of this world and the evil and and uh the next elections and so on and so forth you know you can get a little bit concerned and uh upset wondering what is happening to my world and who is going to rule next and what is going to go on nationally and internationally and even regionally but the greatest comfort is this the king of kings the lord of lords is at the right hand of god the father and he will direct his affairs and he will watch over his children even when they go through difficult and troublesome times. Yes, we must follow the example of Jesus Christ, who, although fully God, humbly and sacrificially gave himself for mankind. And the question, the challenge to us today is, how are we sacrificing ourselves for others? How are we looking out for the interests of others others as mentioned in the previous chapter you know how is it that that we are using our lives to reach other people for jesus christ how are we using our lives to encourage other people in the faith now one of the projects that we have coming up at this christmas time that the ladies are sponsoring and i don't mean to steal a commercial here or a thunder i've got approval but you know they want to have a kind of the angel tree where a family can purchase one gift for, uh, uh, this is for families whose uh, breadwinner, usually the father or the husband, is in prison. And at this Christmas time, they would buy uh, one gift, which would be a toy. I think it's a $20 limit. And then someone else could buy one gift, which would be clothing or something, for $20. And then you get those. And if at all possible, and and certainly this is what we would want, you can take those gifts and you can give them to the people personally. That's a very wonderful way of humbly and sacrificially giving oneself. And there there are other ways throughout the day, at work sometimes. You know, you can help people out. You can go that extra distance to show that, yeah, I belong to Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus Christ would go that extra distance uh, to be of help and ministry and service to other people. That's what we want. That's what Paul is exhorting us to do. He's exhorting us to humbly and sacrificially give ourselves to others.